Welcome to Trending in Education. Mike Palmer here. Excited today to be following up with someone I met in person at the ISTE conference in Philadelphia. Today, I have Mike Achera here with me. He's the founder and president of a company called LuxBlocks. I did pick up one of his products at the conference and was able to build it out and play with it a little bit with my four-year-old. Mike, welcome to Trending in Education. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, it's interesting to have met you at the International Society for Technology and Education because you're more of an analog product in some interesting ways. We'll get into that in a bit, but before we do that, I always like to start with origin stories, get to know you a little bit. How did you get to this point in your professional life? Yeah, and when people say, you know, how did you make this or how did you invent this? It's like, do you want the short story or the biography? Also, when you get older, you start to realize that like your background isn't as normal as you thought it was. Like your family was like more or less crazy than you thought it was. Like everything becomes more in perspective as you get older, right? Yeah. Well, I had a very unique background. I grew up in Chicago suburbs. My dad was a, a contractor, a building contractor. Literally in my backyard was a 76 bed nursing home. My mom was the administrator of the home. She'd walk across the yard to the home and she'd run it. And so I had a very unusual life where my, I was always on the building side as a kid. You know, it's, construction was always going on, hmm. which kind of, I think, informed me a lot. So I went, when I went to college, I went into aerospace design, aerospace engineering for two years. And okay. I wasn't as good as, in math as I thought. And so I en ended up going to an art school, majored in art at Knox College, in hmm. studio art. But my obsession with construction was constant throughout and I became enamored with a fellow named Buckminster Fuller, 20th yeah. century kind of like pop icon in a way, short Yankee guy. Who well, our Buckminster Fuller, I believe. Richard Buckminster Fuller. And he wanted to popularize in the 1920s Einstein's ideas. He wanted right. to bring them to the masses. I've heard and, him. I've also heard him referred to as Bucky. Is that correct? Yeah, Bucky Fuller. In 1990, after I graduated college in 89, the cover of Scientific America was a picture of the geodesic dome as a molecule. Because Croto and Smalley yeah. at the University of Texas in Austin had just discovered the third form, which we didn't know existed. It was diamond and graphite. They found the third form of carbon, which was shaped like a geodesic dome, which was Bucky Fuller's invention. The biosphere, right? The biosphere? No, biosphere is made out of geodesic domes. It was a soccer ball shape. Interesting. Uh, the molecule. Technically, it's called a truncated icosahedron. But nice. Fuller, Fuller had patented this shape as a building and talked about the importance of these buildings in nature. And so they named it, they named the molecule after him. So it's actually, Buckminster Fullerene is actually the third form of carbon, which wow. when I was being a fan of Buckminster Fuller, this was a huge deal that yeah. he was given so much. He was, they named a molecule after him. Right. So I became inspired after college to go live in the woods for two years, read my Walden, you know, on Walden Pond, Thoreau. And I lived in a yurt in the woods. And my goal was kind of like, before I became a normal adult and into the working world, I wanted to kind of break things down one last big time. Yeah. And think about nature and construction and go back to like what Elon Musk would call first principles. Because I always suspected that the way we were taught things wasn't quite right because it never jived with me. Even in mm -hmm. an engineering school, that there's got to be a better way to explain this stuff, to do right. this stuff. So after that, I moved back. I quickly became a muralist in Chicago and a teacher in the Chicago public schools. Wow. And uh, yeah, and then my wife and I ended up getting married. When we were dating, we drive up. We both discovered we loved the architecture of Frank Lloyd Wright which is like a showroom in Chicago. I've been to Falling Water. In Pennsylvania. I haven't oh, been there yet. And the Oak Park is literally a showroom of his homes because his base was in Oak Park, his yeah. home and studio. But he had another home, his famous home and studio was in Wisconsin, in Taliesin, in Spring Green, Wisconsin. So my wife and I would we'd go on dates up there, go camping. Nice. And we, yeah, it was beautiful. And we went to the, one day we went, to, this is part of the story. We went to the bookstore and found this book called Inventing Kindergarten by an author named Brosterman, okay. who was a scholar, a very interesting scholar. And he said, there's a very untold story of history of the inventor of kindergarten, Frederick Froebel, who <laughs> was an interesting cat, 1830s, Napoleonic era. All these kids, no one knew what to do with kids at the time. That's right out of the scholastic era, we just pumped kids' heads full of information. Yeah. That was what education was. Otherwise, kids were useless. And he said he thought kids were something different. And so he came from a scientific background, and he studied literally crystals and mineral crystals. So he wanted to bring to kids these things he called the gifts, to play thing uh, technologies that he invented that, and I'll give you an example of one of them right now with LuxBlocks, but one of the gifts he had was he had these polyhedron that were on strings and the kids would spin them. So here's an example of a, a oh, pyramid, yeah. right? right? Here's a pyramid made of LuxBlocks, but when you spin a Just for folks who can't see it, this is like an inverted, it's like a Christmas tree inverted 
It's a pyramid. Yeah. It's pyramid a, it's a and you're spinning it on the end of a wooden stick. Yeah, I'm spin I'm spinning on a stick, but he'd have them suspended from strings. And the kids would spin these because when you spin a pyramid, it whirls into a cone. It yes. looks like a cone, right? Yes. And that and that what he wanted the kids to see was he wanted them to have a very intimate experience of Newton because calculus is about finding the area under a curve by putting these little tiny rectangles in the curve, right? And yeah, keep, yeah. keep approximating towards this infinity, which is an impossibility. Spheres, curves, they're all impossible. They're all infinites, right? Right, right. Any jeweler will tell you that if you want to yeah. make a sphere out of a piece of crystal, you just keep cutting facets into yeah. it. Smoothness is an illusion. Well said. That's a very deep concept, actually. I'm only getting so many words in, Mike. I got to deliver when I can. Well, the idea of smoothness being an illusion leads to a lot of things because we live in an illusory world where we live in a world of our perceptions, we're prejudiced towards our perceptions, right? Mm -hmm. But what we found out in the 20th century was with people like Einstein, that the old nursery rhyme was really kind of true. Life is but a dream. You know, row, mm -hmm. row, row your boat. Yeah. Because it was more like, life is more like, like this. Like, I, I grew up in this era. Yes. Right? On TV. Uh, was there an NCC 1701 no, on that? He is, there's not. Because we haven't got a license with Viacom yet. And then just for folks who can't see this, listeners, Mike is holding up what looks like the USS Enterprise made entirely with Lux blocks, which we've been kind of burying the lead a little bit here, Mike. So yeah, I'm the inventor of Lux blocks. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so you asked me for my story and where's Lux blocks come from and what makes it so different? So my wife and I, we saw this book, this inventing kindergarten. We were very inspired because in the book, Rosterman, back to that book I told you about, Rosterman shows how not only did Froebel have these amazing things, but a lot of the kids went to these early Froebel kindergartens, which is nothing like the American kindergartens, by the way. Yeah. But very famous people like Frank Lloyd Wright. If you look at Frank Lloyd Wright's prairie style architecture, it came out of the Froebel kindergartens, building these blocks. The, the patterns of the blocks were prairie style architecture. Yeah. Buckminster Fuller famously, when he was six years old, went to one of these kindergartens in Maine. He was legally blind with a myopism of cross, a severe cross-eyed. Mm -hmm. He had no prescription for it. Wow. And so he was blind. The other kids were taking the, one of the famous gifts was the peas and the toothpicks. And the kids, you know, being kids, they'd make a, a square and a triangle and make a house. Yeah. Right? They take sticks and make a little person, little stick person. And Fuller was going by touch. He started connecting triangles together because triangles are the only true stable poly right. polygon. So he made, first he made triangles, then he connected the triangles together and made tetrahedrons, which like is a, carbon. Like a, a, lattice, then, a lattice structure of some kind? He made a lattice structure that went to the ceiling. And later on, he actually patented it as an octet truss. And you see them over ATM machines and mobile stations. Interesting. They're like the trusses over everything. Huh. Okay. But he patented something he discovered in kindergarten. So the Bauhaus movement in Germany claimed all of their basic revolution in art came out of the kindergartens they went to, these Froebel kindergartens. Interesting. So my wife and I were like, holy crap, what were they doing in these kindergartens? And why are they doing it now? And what can we do now? Since that was the 1830s and we're like almost the 2030s now. What right. can we do? What do we have? What we learned in mm. two, almost 200 years? Right. And we went back to Einstein and relativity and chaos and fractal geometry. Yeah. And we d developed Lux blocks, which imitates the structural forms found in nature at the molecular and actually at the experiential level. But things you don't normally think about, like the shape of clouds, the shape of smoke, the yeah. shape of fluids, the shape of animal structure and cells. You know, and we were a big Lego family. And we thought deeply about what Lego is. And Lego is basically a 10,000-year-old technology, brick art. And it's a high form of brick art. Yeah. But Lego gives you a brick facsimile of everything. And nature makes a brick facsimile of virtually nothing. So nature's not working in that paradigm. So we wanted yeah. to work in the natural paradigm. It sounds pretentious and weird, but that's what we were going for. And that's what we found. That's amazing. And your wife is co-founder and CEO. Yeah, and she was my partner in crime. And she'd come yeah. home from work. She's always had the day job. And she'd come home from work as crazy homeschool dad, working with like kids all over the neighborhood with 3D printers, with a makerspace in our garage, mm. coming up with crazy ideas. And we had this idea after volunteering for FRC Robotics of prototyping an idea that I'd come up with. So there was a kid down the street, a German 15-year-old kid who had immigrated to America with his family. Because homeschooling is still illegal in Germany. It's an old Hitler rule. So they're missionary people. They come here. So these brilliant Germans down the street. So he was helping me doing the AutoCAD. And I was doing the drawings because I'm a trained artist. And we started developing these mock-ups, these prototypes. And we'd have kids come over and test it. It eventually led to a, a really strong working model. And we went to a trade show with just prototypes and yeah. t-shirts and uh, set up a booth and a little viral video we made went viral at the show. Hmm. And we had $10,000 in sales in a couple hours. So we're like, yeah. better buy a mold and go get into business. And that's what yeah. happened. Yeah, it's pretty interesting to play around with because it does open up your mind in terms of 
the dimensionality and depth to it, and you were mentioning architecture, it did remind me a little bit of some of Gaudi as well, yeah. the inspiration from the natural world. And again, Mike, for those who are listening at home, there is some interesting movement and manipulation yeah, so I'm of showing the Lux you what, blocks. I'm showing yes. you what a building wants to do. So when you put Lux together, you'll make an unstable structure that wiggles and squishes. Any carpenter will tell you if you make a building out of just two by fours and don't put any diagonals or any plywood on it, the two by fours, those parallelograms have no structure really, just the yeah. nails holding them in. They'll, they'll gyro right. and spin. And an architect in California might want some of that. They right. want the energy to transfer through the structure, but the kids will discover these deep architectural concepts just yeah. through play. Right. Fuller always talked about pattern integrity. One of our most famous toys is our flexors. That's they cool. create these kinematic linkage systems. It looks like a workout you could do with that thing. Like a, yeah, an accordion. It's a, yes. it's all made out of squares. A squeeze box. It, yeah, like a squeeze box, but it shows you a mechanical reduction of squish. We think of squish as like, we think of pillows, they squish, right? But we can't tune into the little machinations going on at the microscopic level that are allowing those little cells of those, whatever kind yeah, of material they're using they to do. squish down. But this shows you what is physically happening and your brain's like, what the heck? I'm experiencing a visualization of squish, but I'm also feeling squish. And it makes your brain, it's a very satisfying experience. Yeah, it's really interesting just thinking about the cognitive abilities around spatial awareness and thinking like a builder, thinking like an architect or an engineer or a designer. What have you seen on that front? I imagine it's a pretty open-ended platform, so you probably get surprised by what people can come up with. We get a lot of people coming to us, a lot of parents of kids, oftentimes on the spectrum, and these kids are just See, I just think that we overprescribe boys that naturally are kind of ADHD. You know, yeah, I just think that's yeah. a boy thing. They want to be out and play and stream and build a dam. They don't want to be in an office space all day. So I think a lot of these kids are just builders. But a lot of these kids are on the spectrum for sure. But they come out with these ingenious things. And the parents will say they'll spend, you know, a whole day just working on things without any instructions, just designing stuff. I have to keep buying them more blocks because they keep building things. They want to make bigger things. But... I was thinking about a word today for our conversation because you gave me a list of questions last night right before I went to bed. So my brain at three in the morning is like, yeah, pops up with you were, up. you're actually lucid dreaming right now, Mike. You haven't been on the show yet. <laughs> Life is but a dream. So I had this word called epiphany, you know, and it comes from the Catholic tradition of epiphanal experience. Usually it's a spiritual thing, but an epiphany is like so many of my heroes in life, like Einstein and stuff, they go on these walks or play a violin. And they said that their great insights came in these giant leaps, mm -hmm. these flashes of insight. Yeah. And what I'm finding with Lux Blocks is it's kind of, I like to think of it as a tool that provides very fertile ground for epiphanal experience. Usually education is seen of as a very meticulous step-by-step -step going to the Vygotsky, you know, the scaffolded ladder yeah. of the teachers the, the, in control. The zone of proximal, the zone of development. proximal development. Yeah. Okay. I think this thing kind of antagonizes the zone and also flips the zone on its head because the expected outcome is not what you get with Lux Blocks. You'll get kids that have artistic or even scientific insights into a form. They can't put words to it. They're not at the education level to actually appreciate what they just discovered. But it gives you, what Lux also gives you is a really crazy shape language that's right out of like, you know, third year, you know, differential equations or fluid dynamics. Yes. Where it's a very collegiate level spatial experience in play. Yes. So the kids, which Lego just really can't give you. Lego is very much, you know, brick laying. And it's just, Lux just gives you these symmetrical polyhedra right from the get-go you know right. it's just it's also very correlated to nature so you'll see these at the microscopic level i'm a big fan of a little known guy he should be more famous two naturalists darcy wentworth thompson who wrote the book on growth and form considered one of the greatest books in the english language he was a contemporary of darwin but the one i want to tell you about is ernst heichel ernst heichel is famous for those posters you see in college dorms of all the microscopic diatoms because ernst heichel was a kind of a frustrated artist in the 1800s who didn't know what to do with his life. He went down to, he was English. He went down to um, Naples, Italy, and he had one of those early viewers and he was looking like, like a microscope. He was looking at underwater bacteria or not bacteria, but like diatom, little crustaceous kind of diatoms yeah. and, and uh, protists. And he started drawing them and he discovered this whole realm of beauty at the microscopic level. He discovered his life. And when the Challenger came back from its great journey around the world, this big naturalistic journey with the HMS Challenger, they yeah. had all this stuff at Oxford. They didn't have to do with it. All these samples. They said, well, just give Heichel the job of like going through all these algae samples and making drawings of them all. He cataloged almost 5,000 species that he got to name of these things. He, he did drawings and paintings of all of them. Hmm. And he became, and they all look like this. 
I mean, they all look like this. They all look yeah. like Lux blocks. So yeah. it, when you get to the very small level of nature, things get highly symmetrical and highly geometric. So that's the great thing about Lux blocks is your kids can experience that level of, of nature, which is the majority of what's going on. We live between infinities as humans, right? There's the stars out there and there's the molecules and atoms that we can't see. We, and we can barely right. see either one of them, but that's mostly what's going on. And Lux kind of exposes kids to that reality, which we think is really cool. Great stuff. I'm talking with Mike Achera, who is the co-founder and president of Luxblox. That's L-U-X-B-L-O-X, luxblox.com. You can check out what they have going on because it is, it's just interesting to explore a different foundational concept. You know, I love Legos. I'm a parent of a four-year-old. I couldn't survive really without Legos, although I still feel like they could be easier on my feet when I accidentally step on them. But the Luxblox just opened up my thinking around there being other opportunities for platforms to design against. You know, it's a different foundational Absolutely. And you structure. said you love Gaudi, and we love Gaudi too, the Spanish architect. He's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And he was working in the Lego paradigm, but look how he blew it up. What Gaudi did was, which was really interesting, he took, maybe you've seen these pictures where he took rope and he put clay, wet clay and rope, and he'd hang the rope upside down in these curves these parabolic, I think it's parabolic curves. What he'd do is once the clay dried, he'd invert the clay. And those were the forms of his cathedrals were mm -hmm. those beautiful natural forms, right? Because that's what the curve that nature wanted to do. So it wasn't just an arbitrary thing on a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. And it would also make them the strongest form too. But he was still using a lot of times brick and concrete because he had to work with the materials available. But the inspiration was very much from nature and natural structures. It's really interesting stuff. And, you know, this is an education podcast. We've been talking implicitly about education really the whole time, but let's get a little more explicit about that context where I imagine there are ways in which educators and parents who are thinking about how to open up the creativity, open up the maker's mindset in kids. How do you think about education? How do folks who are focused on that side of things, how do they use a product like LuxBlox? Well, I come from education. I taught in Chicago public schools and then down here in Galesburg and have my own art school. And I dug deep into educational history and like how they did it. And what were some interesting times in history? The Renaissance is a very interesting time because they lost Michelangelo, Donatello, and Leonardo, the three turtles, all like within 50 years of each other, right? There's one family, the Caracci family out of Bologna, Italy. History is so weird when you start studying, like I, I'm learning things nobody else talks about anymore. But the Caracci family were very concerned about the loss of that treasure because they, they lost these three geniuses in the Germans and the Dutch and the Spanish and the French were hot on the heels of Italian artists around mm -hmm. Europe. Like, how do we make this a cultural thing, like an institutionalized, like an educational movement? Right. You know, because there, there were no, it was like more like Asia was like, there was master's studios. Right. But there was no movement. That's so interesting. They, there was like a genius race. Yeah. And then when the geniuses died, like who's going to replace the geniuses? And can ah. we model some kind of like a martial arts system mm -hmm. where we can like, we can build geniuses because martial yeah. arts, of course, and music are both really good, at least pe making people imitate geniuses, right? If they're right. not geniuses, they can get really, they can fool most people. Right. And so art had to get to go in that race that sports and martial arts and things had been so good at training people. When I visited the Soviet Union in 87, I saw young ballerinas that were just amazing compared to American ballerinas. And it's because they had the old abusive system where they literally right. beat the kids into submission, right? Right. We don't do that. But they still, the, Russia wanted, Russia had been desperate to catch up to the West because they felt like the, under the czars, they felt like they were really behind. Right. So they had it. Anyways, my point is that the Italians invented this way of teaching drawing that I used in inner city Chicago. I found this book by Fialetti and it was like how to draw human anatomy and all these beautiful designs with the, the, if you just had basic handwriting strokes, you can build a whole toolbox of great, you could fool so many people. By learning these little algorithms, okay, these little rules, like yeah. long division. Functions. Yeah, exactly. So it was like coding. So I was like, okay, there's a way to code education to at least get kids to a level where they feel very confident, and then they can get into more of an epiphanal level of being creative. Mm -hmm. So there's, it's both. It's, people always say it's either one or the other. Either education is direct instruction and hard-nosed, old-fashioned, listen to what I got to teach a kid, I'm smarter than you, right? Or it's let the kids tell you what they want to learn and be freewheeling, you know, loosey-goosey. And mm -hmm. I think it's really, there's a sweet, every good teacher knows there's a sweet spot right in the middle where, you, of course, you're the adult. Of course, you know lots of things. But of course, these kids are potential geniuses and they have so much insight to give you too. And there's a back and forth. I think good teachers all know that. Yeah. 
It's really, you know, now that we're talking, it is making me also think about movement. And I've heard the term manipulatives, where like the fact that kids can actually be using their hands when they're engaging. And it does remind me of innovation offsites that I've been to, where, you know, a group of executives get to play around with Legos so that it spurs innovative thinking. But it's actually true. And I hadn't really thought about this in that context, but I do imagine just the fact that you can almost feel the movement of something, even if you're thinking about something else, it does probably get you into a different way of thinking. Well, yeah, if kids don't experience going into the forest and negotiating a forest environment or going by a pond or a creek and putting their hand into a pond and stirring up the mud and picking up a snail, all those things I think are hugely formative for kids. They crystallize in their brain. They remember the rest of their lives. Yeah. Why is that? Because nature does have this spatial richness to it, this texture that you're talking about kinesthetic learning and yeah. learning through fidgets. Nature is the ultimate fidget, of course. Mm -hmm. I can't even, you know, but what Lux does is it takes nature and, and reduces it to a plaything that shows these first principles. And we're a big Lego fan. I'm not going to knock Lego. Lego's high brick art, the highest brick art, really yeah. it is. Yeah. But we could look at all of our life as just living on these like ruins, right? Of the greatness of past civilizations. We all live in a ruin, right? And my wife and I are trying to create a new technology that honors those ruins, but says, okay, but you can make that, that Roman viaduct, you know, vibrate and go into a wave and squish up and down and become more like Dr. Seuss, yeah. you know? And you can see like the, a, a new kind of realm of nature in the potential of structure. Yeah. And like I said, you were at an ed tech summit. And this is a place where we're thinking about the future of education. We're thinking about the future of work. And it's a place where the disruption that we've seen with some of the generative AI and some of these new tools that are emerging, as I was thinking about your product and thinking about the conversation that we were going to have, it does seem somewhat AI resistant and it does seem to tap into some human capabilities. I'd be curious how you think about the future of work and how you think about how using interactive products, tools, physical things, how they may in some ways prepare the humans for a very different future in which who knows what they'll be doing. Yeah, I think humans are stuck in, Thomas Malthus kind of ruined us uh, for mm -hmm. a long time because we're stuck in the zero-sum gain idea of, a, the, of an, a universe that's always in a state of decay mm -hmm. and always in a state of loss and running out, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you guys don't know, Thomas Malthus was a famous economist, demographer yeah. in the 18th century who worked for the East India Company College. The East India Company was kind of like the biggest corporation in the world at the time, founded by the Queen Elizabeth, actually, the first limited liability corporation, so that the sailors couldn't sue the ship owners when their, their husbands were killed. They couldn't get money. So it was like the first time it protected liability, right, for the investors. So anyways, this East India Company had get, gathered so much information for the first time in human history from around the world, all this data, right, of the crops in India and the sugar crops in the Caribbean yeah. and, and the mortality of disease. And they all went to one place, East India Company College, and one guy was looking at this data, Thomas Malthus, and he said, obviously, that we can only produce goods and services at an yeah. arithmetic rate, but we're producing children at a geometric rate. And so we're all going to run out of food and die real soon. So we better bake bullets and bombs because we're going to have a war. Right, and, right. And, and, Mar and Marx embraced this, and so did the big titans of industry embrace this. And mm -hmm. we went to war through a whole century because of these presuppositions. But people like Henry Ford were proving that, like, no, you should make a car for the people who actually were working on the assembly line. And you should do more with less. And this idea of optimization proved Malthus was wrong because Malthus couldn't know uh, that the tensile strength of metals and that there was going to be a revolution yeah. in invention in plastics mm -hmm. and all these different materials, material revolutions would make the average person, the poor person, be able to afford enough food, cars, houses. So we just kept getting richer and richer, but we're still in this idea that we're going to run out. Yeah. Uh, we're we're going to run out of jobs for kids. We're going to, and we keep not running out because we keep thinking of cooler ideas and new cottage industries that sprout up around other industries. So yeah. I think we're in really good shape. I think AI is going to make the consumer more powerful. It already is. It's going to put few people out of work, but, you know, we still make saddles. We still make carriages, right. but not as many, right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> to your credit, and actually perhaps a little bit to our credit on the show, is I've referenced Malthus a few times, but there's oh, yeah. no way Good. I had the level of detail that you just laid out for us. Cool. So, so thank you for that. It is one of those things where, you know, 10 years ago, how many folks would have expected us to have the jobs and live in the reality that we do today. And then if you think 20, 30, 50 years ahead, 
who knows, but the idea that there will be different ways of thinking that are introduced by products and services like those you're designing is really part of the answer. That brings me to the idea of a, an inventor's mindset and someone who's really made his career on innovating. Do you have any advice either for folks who are thinking about starting their own company, start an entrepreneur, someone who has an idea, but then specifically as someone who's inventing, I don't even know what you would call it, new technology, new things that you can build. Do you have any advice for the rest of us as we think about preparing for the future? It's important to develop skills. My skill set was definitely drawing and building with my hands, model making. That was my skill set. And so I used it to my advantage. But it's also important to have the mindset of, I, I think I grew up fortunate because my father was significantly older when I was born. So he was born in 1919. So I was, mm -hmm. even though I'm technically Gen X, I'm really a baby boomer by a training. Yeah. So my, my father, unlike a lot of vets, talked about his experience in the war, talked mm -hmm. about growing up in the depression. And also I developed early on a sense that we really weren't so smart. That we really, that what people were just assuming was the way to think about the world, I was suspect of, okay? And it came down to me like having heroes like, like Einstein, people who were questioning like, you know, things like, you, you think space and time and matter are set. But like I brought up, I showed you the Enterprise because when I grew up as a kid, I'm sitting with my mom watching the, some of the original episodes or at least early syndication of, of Captain Kirk while my dad was at a hockey game in Chicago Blackhawks or something. And if you got put in the brig in the Enterprise, there wasn't a door, right? What was there? It was like a force. You were yeah. like a mime. Yes. <laughs> Don't touch the force field. Right? Or if you got attacked, you wouldn't have, you know, iron, thick iron hull. You'd have shields. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And we find out now that actually, I was just telling a woman the other day who's actually in ministry. And I said, you know, the truth of nature is closer to what Christians have been talking about more than they realize that there is the idea of thingness of the material world is actually just made up. Yeah. It's built in a prejudice that we are tuned in to see certain things as opaque, right? We know now from our scientific learning that there are molecules, high energy particles that go right through things all the time mm -hmm. that don't even know they're there, that right. the relative proximity of an atom's uh, nucleus and electron are like the earth and the sun, that there's right. this vastness of empty space. Mm -hmm. So what makes thing, something a thing is what Fuller would call a patterned integrity. Yeah. Okay, It's more of a metaphysical truth than it is a concrete physical truth. J.J. Yeah. Gibson might call it an affordance. An affordance. Oh, that's interesting. I yeah. haven't heard that. It's more of an interface or like a doorknob is an affordance where it affords you to grab it and turn it. Right. You know, a push is a flat panel, hole is a handle. That's more in like user experience design, usability. You design with the affordances in mind. And as humans, we're used to being physical, being kinesthetic in the way you're describing, in which case we have to, we understand physicality. We understand how solid things are when we grab them. Exactly. That's really interesting. And my point was that we have to believe in it too much. And that these principles, like, you know, battles would be lost in the high seas because of a metallurgical truth that one side didn't know about. So there was a metallurgy in the gun of an opposing battleship to look like it was rated as the same level of pocket battleship. They're the same ship, except one battleship had in it mm -hmm. a new alloy in the barrel that let that shell go maybe a few hundred yards longer. Wow. But the enemy went down with the secret. <laughs> <laughs> so there's these scientific truths out there that are based on a metaphysical thing about how molecules go together. And uh, I find that really fascinating. And I think people who are scientifically tuned in know that like, yeah, this isn't really that real. It's real enough to negotiate, not like bump your head and get hit by a car and burn yourself. Mm -hmm. But otherwise... We're living in a vibration kind of force field universe. Makes it more amazing, actually. I think it makes yeah. it much more cooler. Yeah. And that's what I mean. There's room for improvement because we're still, I think, and my wife said, be careful. Don't criticize teachers because we're business people, we, but they're our customers, right? And I won't. But I would say that in some ways, we're really not that much different than we were in the Middle Ages. We still have a lot of growth to do. Yeah. And it does take awareness that there are different paradigms to shift into. And that gets back to my point where like Lux blocks, as opposed to Legos, it's not really an either or it's no. more, if you can understand that there are different foundational ways to like, even getting back to, you know, Fuller's different structure that you were talking about earlier, they're just different ways that things can be oriented. And the more you can be tuned into those different approaches, those different mental models, those different paradigms. It really does open up your potential for creativity, your potential for innovation and adaptation. Absolutely. Yeah. I'll give you an example. Like Minecraft, which is a Lego universe. Okay. It's the XYZ coordinate system of Descartes, right? 
And computers are all aligned to that because the math is very simple, right? It's up and down, side to side, you know, Z, X, Y, Z, yeah. axis. It's Cartesian. So it, it's Cartesian. Yeah, Descartes, right? Exactly. So computers love Minecraft. Minecraft will never heat up a computer. You can make an infinite world out of Minecraft and the computer's like, huh, what, 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 is that all you got? But le Lux blocks will literally raise the temperature in a processor. Right, because you need a, 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 a. We've tried, believe me, we've tried. Mm. We've used Unity, the gaming machines. Right. And the problem is the physics, it's the physics engine. To model Lux blocks requires a really sophisticated physics engine mm. that just makes computers just get really hot. Yeah. And AI has, we've tested it, AI has not been able to do Lux blocks yet. Yeah, but the spatial, we've given it pictures of it and like the, the spatial, like, spatial computing and AR, VR and quantum chips. Mike, it's all going to get sorted out in the next five to 10, right? Come on. It will. But the, yeah, you see the size of a quantum computer? It's like the size of a three-story building. Yeah. It's huge. Yeah. And it's going to be amazing. But right. We, and I'm a, big, I'm a big cheerleader of technology, so, so I, I totally hear you. I know you're being kind of sarcastic, but I, I think it's all going to get sorted out. But yeah. right now, Luxblox is still challenging computers. And we wanted to have a computer game based on Luxblox, like Minecraft. And like, right. We had people at Wolfram, Tech, Wolfram Research down the road from us who invented, like, you know, Mathematica. Yeah. And I've interviewed Conrad Wolfram. And they're like, yeah, just, it's not, we're not as advanced as you think we are. <laughs> right. Yeah. But especially comes with big systems. It's really hard. Yeah. And having that flexibility of thought so that you understand different systems. It's even like, you know, the problem with, is light a wave or a particle? It's actually both and neither at the same time. This whole indeterminate multiverse that we're living yeah, in. Yeah, the quantum is. universe. You yeah, know, that goes with yeah. Einstein's experiment where they had to go, he had a beautiful theory, but you have to prove a theory, right? And they had to go to Africa to look at a, an eclipse. So because Mercury was going to be in retrograde or something like that. And right. they would be able, be able to see if a star should be where it's supposed to be. Or if Einstein was right and the star would be in the wrong position. Right. Because space is actually warped. Yeah. Which is an insane concept that space would be bent. Right. You know, and right. he proved it. So right. that's, life is weird. Life is weird. Lots going on. This is an interesting conversation. I'm talking to Mike Chera, who founded Luxblocks, L-U-X-B-L-O-X.com. Check it out and learn more. Mike, love to have you back on. This was a fun conversation. We went all kinds of places, which was amazing. As we wrap up, I always like to get some parting thoughts, closing remarks. Anything else you want to hit us with before we wrap up here? Well, I don't want people to be, if there's teachers out there, please don't be intimidated by the big word talk because I offer free professional development for any school who buys your stuff. So I will get on a Zoom call with anybody you want me to and talk them through it, hold their hand, because really I've had teachers buy the stuff and say, I never took it out of the box because it freaked me out. And mm -hmm. it's like, and like, really all you have to do is open it up and dump them on the table and the kids are going to love you. Right. But I will, I did, I, we have curriculum online, free curriculum. We're in India and Japan right now, and the Indians and Japanese are loving it. So it's, it works in the classroom, but I will help you. That's all I can say. And I will say, as the parent of a four-year-old, I was able to handle the six-plus difficulty kit that you gave me. There's a bit of a learning curve, but it's not that hard. And my four-year-old, I think, will be ramping into it shortly. Really appreciate a lot of what you brought here. Inspired my thinking, certainly, during this conversation. Hopefully, our listeners enjoyed it as well. Mike, thanks so much for joining me on today's show. Thank you, Mike. I really appreciate it. And for our listeners, if you did like what you heard, tell your friends, share the good words, subscribe, do all the good things. We'll be back again soon. This is Trending in Education. <laughs>